My first week at the Operations Training Centre was spent meeting everyone, some 45 full-time and acting instructors, and getting to know what was to be expected of me. Cyril Sweet, who was a senior instructor, said that I would be first sitting in on a five-week rules course, but as I was still an acting instructor, this meant I was still available to work Saturdays and Sundays as a driver back at my depot at Woking. Each Saturday was classed as a rest day, so the rate of pay would be time and a half and Sunday rate was time and three quarters, but I did have some weekends off. It was during this time, the night of the 15th of October 1987, and the following morning, that a hurricane struck the south of Britain and caused absolute turmoil to the transport system. Trees were blown down and were blocking railway lines, and even the road to the station was blocked in several places, so it took me all morning to get to work. The course had to be abandoned for the day, as the trainees had also found it difficult to get to the training school. In the meantime, another acting instructor had arrived at the OTC, Dave Webb, who lived at Dover. Dave and I hit it off straight away. He was of similar seniority as myself, and had been a fireman at Nottingham, so we had a lot in common. On the 30th of November, I was booked to instruct on my first traction trainee course with six trainees, five from Hither Green and one from Bournemouth. On the 12th of December, my wife and I attended my first office party, which was held at the BR Staff Association Club at Waterloo, which was quite a social event, and where we met some of the other instructors' wives and girlfriends. On the 22nd of December, I had to sit my own rules exam with George Taylor, one of the chief traction inspectors, which I thankfully passed, and this took a weight off my shoulders before the Christmas period. My course continued on the 4th of January 1988, but I did work some of the days preceding this back at Woking, where I was booked route refreshers most of the week. All six students of my first traction trainee course were passed out by David Timothy with flying colours. This photo shows the 1974 instructors roster for the Southside Training School and its satellite training venues, Stewart's Lane and Southampton. There were 22 names on the list, some of which were still at the OTC Southside when I joined, namely Cyril Sweet, Bernie Byrne, Derek Gain, Fred Johnson, Don Ottinen, Ted Greavesherd, Alan Rowe and Eric Christian. All others had either retired or in one case passed away and Bill White had become Chief Traction Inspector on the South Western Division. When I joined the training school in 1987 as an acting instructor, there were 50 instructors at the OTC Southside and six instructors at Basingstoke. The training programme for train drivers at the time was called MP12 and trainees had to undergo the following courses. Five weeks training on rules, three weeks on the principles of route learning, nine weeks traction training, practical, and seven weeks revision. The training programme then changed. As a precondition, prospective drivers must already have completed 90 turns as a train man example as a guard, second man or driver's assistant. At least 40 of these turns must have been spent in the driving cab. This would permit some preliminary understanding of the driver's responsibilities, signals, routes etc. So it changed to four weeks training on rules, four weeks traction training, two weeks driving with an instructor, eight weeks driving with a qualified minder driver and two weeks with the instructor. All training and progress was recorded by the trainee in a logbook, which was monitored and signed daily by the trainer. At the end of each stage marked in the programme, the trainee took an examination to ensure full understanding and that they had reached the standard required. If unsuccessful, the trainee was allowed one further attempt. If they failed a second time, they would be withdrawn from the training programme. The newly qualified driver then went to their own depot to learn the routes they were not familiar with. Their performance thereafter as a driver was monitored initially by the training centre but principally by the local traction inspectorate. The names of many colleagues that I worked with at the OTC Southside during the period I was there that aren't shown in the following photographs are listed here. This photograph shows from left to right Cyril Sweet, Chris Exley, Ian Verinder, Mike Gill, Chris Foote, John Hartford, Tim Reynolds, 
Martin Squibb and Alan Brindley. This photograph shows from left to right Peter De Lacey, Jim Samuel, Mark Medley, Jeff Birch, Dave Brown, Ralph Sullivan, Graham Inky Penn, Jerry Waite and Alan Rowe. Finally, from left to right, Peter Roberts, Ian Glover, Trevor Chopper Harris, Ian Simmons, Bernie Byrne, David Timothy, Tony Harper and Chris Haynes. For the rest of January, I was booked to cover a variety of days of a rules course, whilst one of my colleagues was on leave, and on the 12th of February, I had to take my course notes, etc., to Basingstoke Training School, as I was going to run another traction trainee course there, starting on the 15th of February. Basingstoke Training School was a satellite of the main one at OTC Southside, and was situated on the upside of the station and Don Ottenham was the senior instructor in charge. Don made me very welcome. I'd fired to Don when he'd been a driver at Guildford in the steam days, and we got on very well. There were ten trainees on my course this time, four of them being from my home depot at Woking. As each lesson progressed, I became more confident in my teaching methods, and the sitting-in sessions on other courses and listening to other instructors had helped a great deal. There were quite a number of out days and I was joined by fellow instructor Peter Roberts to assist me at Stewart's Lane for the coupling uncoupling procedures and for the other depot visits. Unfortunately on the third week I lost one of my trainees as he had an accident whilst riding his motorcycle suffering a broken collarbone. On the 24th of March the group was split into two groups for their exam taken by Ken Norris and Don Ottinen and eight of the nine trainees passed one failing on placing track circuit clips incorrectly. On the 28th of March I returned to the OTC Southside and was booked to sit in on another course, this time an MP12 EMU traction course for driver's assistance run by Martin Bowman. Peter Johns, another acting instructor, was also going to sit in on the course. This course was of five weeks duration, ten days longer than I received when I had an EMU course in 1969, but this did also cover the class 455 element. The course structure started with the theory of basic electricity and how the current reached the unit via the third rail, then moving on to the 1951 EPB, electro-pneumatic brake type of unit. After teaching the theory part, the following day will be spent at a static day at a depot such as Victoria or Grove Park, teaching the practical part cabin equipment layout, paddling up procedures etc. Here again the group was split up, Martin running one group and Derek Gain running the other. Over the next two weeks there were two more static days, the first being spent at Grove Park, this time covering main reservoir air bursts and the second day covering brake pipe bursts. All the procedures would be listed in the Fulton Failure Books that were issued to each driver during the course. The other event covered on the day were coupling and uncoupling procedures and bearing in mind this was probably the first time that any of the trainees had actually moved the train. It sometimes proved a bit tense for the trainee and the instructors alike. The third static day was then followed by four days practical handling and as the South Western Division didn't operate any 1951 EBB stock these days were spent over routes I'd never been over before. London Bridge to Red Hill via East Croydon and from Victoria to Orpington and return. However, this was good for me as I needed to learn these routes before taking a group of students on my own. All practical handling was completed by using service trains and in most cases the driver would gladly let you take over and although they were supposed to stay with the train, quite often they disappeared to the mess room or had an early day. Following the 1951 EPB part of the course, the units built in 1957 were covered. Although similar in style and build, fuse cupboards, layout and fuse changing procedures were totally different. The 1957 unit having MCBs, miniature circuit breakers, within the low tension part of the fuse cupboard instead of cartridge fuses. The following day was spent at a depot and we were joined by Mick Oakley. I'd known Mick for a number of years before I joined the training school as he'd been a driver at Guildford and I took a keen interest in his style of teaching. 
The next part of the course was of the 1963 stock variety, 4 VET, 4 BIG or 4 SIG. I'd been driving this type of stock since passing as a driver myself, so I was completely familiar with the cab and equipment layout. The only stock that I didn't normally see were the 4 SIG type with the electric parking brake, so a day static took place at Streatham Hill Depot. The 1963 stock practical handling days were completed over familiar territory, Waterloo to Portsmouth Harbour, Woking to Alton, Woking to Basingstoke, and Waterloo to Reading via Ascot. We did, though, have a change one day and worked from Victoria to Dover. DIC units were also covered, and on another static day we went to Victoria to look at MLVs, motor luggage vans. On the final day of the course, the trainees were introduced to the Class 455 units. On the 26th of May, I was booked annual leave for two weeks, but was told beforehand that Peter Johns and I would be commencing an EMU schematic course on the 13th of June. Two admirers watch as driver Barry Foster departs with a shuttle service from Woking Down Bay to Guildford with Preserve 2 Bill 2090 during the Woking 150 celebrations in May 1988. I returned from holiday in Thassos quite refreshed to learn that all of the trainees on the MP12 course that I'd been with had passed their traction exam, which was good news. Peter Johns and myself were now going to learn EMU schematics, passing the exam at the end being a necessary requirement for an instructor teaching any of the traction courses at OTC Southside. Apart from having to have an in-depth knowledge of the electrical equipment appertaining to the traction side of things, having an in-depth knowledge of how the various forms of braking system operate was also a requirement. The instruction was going to take several weeks to complete, and when the instructor thought that we were ready, we would sit an exam with a member of the CM&EE department. Unfortunately, the period of time given was interrupted by having to run different weeks of another traction trainee course at Basingstoke, and Peter and I had only one instructor that really wasn't interested in teaching us, as he had his mind on another project, two Class 465 simulators which were being built at OTC Southside for the training of South Eastern Division drivers. Another problem that interrupted our training was that a group of us, Dave Webb, John Brookshaw, Peter Johns and myself, were booked to attend a two-week residential core training skills course at Watford, commencing on the 25th of July. This was Pauline's 40th birthday, so I can't say that I was keen on being away from home, but off I went to join the others at the Management Training Centre at The Grove, Watford. I did, however, manage to get a bunch of red roses to pull in via my nephew. The first week we were given various projects and had to choose subjects to talk about. My first subject was how to load a film into a 35mm camera, and my second was how to operate a slide projector carousel. We had to demonstrate how it was done, and then asked someone else to perform the task. It then went on to delivering a lesson plan that was work orientated and I chose a further two subjects, one on how electricity was transferred to the third rail from the national grid and the second was how electricity was collected from the conductor rail and transferred to other equipment on the train. Both of these presentations were captured on video and after seeing the first one I certainly learnt by my mistakes. I was really determined to do a good job on the second week and burnt the midnight oil to get it just right. On the final day, the second presentation went extremely well, apart from a motor mower cutting the grass outside, and I felt far more at ease with the audience. Upon interview with the course tutor, George Kershaw, I was very pleased to hear that I'd passed the course with no need for further assessment. Back at the OTC Southside on the 8th of August, it was decided that Bernie Byrne and Mick Oakley were going to take over our EMU schematic instruction, and for the next five weeks, Peter Johns and I knuckled down to learn as much as we could. Apart from working out the sequence of how everything worked on the schematic, we would go to various depots and examine everything in detail to get a good understanding of what the equipment looked like and its position on the train. On the 14th of September I sat my exam. 
electric schematics in the morning and brake schematics in the afternoon and thankfully both Peter and I passed. I remember it being one of the hardest exams I'd ever taken and ending up having a splitting headache. Because I'd missed the class 455 part of the MP12 course I'd sat in on earlier in the year, it was decided that I should sit in on the further 455 course with Ken Norris. By this time there was another MP12 course running and for the next month I was booked to assist on static and driving instruction days before starting my first EMU course on the 7th of November. This was also going to be held at Basingstoke, so again, I had to move all of my course notes, etc. As you can imagine, getting to Basingstoke was quite a trek for some of the southeastern trainees. I started the course off but missed the second week because of annual leave. I then picked up the course again on the 28th of November with a third 1951 static day at Victoria assisted by two other instructors, and the rest of the week 1951 stock driving instruction with four students working trips from Victoria to Orpington and return, or from Wimbledon to West Croydon, nicknamed the Spratton Winkle Line. On Monday the 12th of December 1988, whilst I was travelling from Woking to Waterloo on my way to the training school, the train came to a stand between Weybridge and Walton. We stood at the signal for ages, so I decided to make my way to the front of the train to see the driver and learnt that a disaster had occurred. A train that was travelling in front of us had run into the back of another at Clapham Junction, and via the phone communication with the signalman, news filtered back that a Woking driver and colleague of mine, Alex McClyman, had been killed, along with many other passengers. I managed to reach the training school some hours later by travelling from Wimbledon to Waterloo via Victoria and found that all training had been cancelled for the day. Eventually I made my way back to Woking Station and had the shock of my life to see Alex walking along the platform towards me. He looked awful. It transpired that he'd been the driver of the train that had stopped at the signal outside Clapham Junction to phone the signalman to inform him of a signal irregularity. As he was talking to the signalman on the signal post telephone, another train driven by a Bournemouth driver had run into the back of his train. Alex had only just been debriefed when I met him at Woking and I gave him a lift to Guildford to pick up his car that he'd left there that morning. I offered to drive him to his home but he declined the offer and said he wanted to be on his own for a while. Up until this day that tragedy has scarred his life and the horrors that he witnessed must have affected him deeply. This accident has been until then the worst railway disaster in recent years. 35 people lost their lives including the Bournemouth driver and another driver who was in the cab with him. The training school closed on the 23rd of December for the Christmas recess and I returned to Woking as a driver. Back to depot, as Cyril Sweet would say in his Welsh accent. The following week I took the reins again with EMU course number 15 at Basingstoke. The first day was class 455 in the classroom and second day class 455 static which we performed at Strawberry Hill. The next two days were class 455 driving instruction from Waterloo to Guildford and then back to Basingstoke for revision on all subjects. For the next four months I was booked a variety of work assisting different courses with Mick Oakley on statics and driving instruction from Victoria to Orpington for the EPB work and Waterloo to Portsmouth and Waterloo to Reading for the 1963 work. It was on a return trip from Portsmouth to Waterloo when I had to take control of a train outside of Waterloo Station. As we approached Waterloo, home signal, which was displaying a red aspect, the trainee made no attempt to stop, so I had to jump across the cab and apply the emergency brake myself, with the train just about coming to a stand underneath the signal. I asked the trainee what he was thinking of, and he said that his mind was miles away. It was the only time that I'd had to take a person off a course, but I think I made the right decision. Following a heat wave in the third week of May, I experienced a thunderstorm with such ferocity that I've never seen before or since. Because the car park on the downside of Woking Station is completely covered in tarmac, the heavy downpour had nowhere else to go but into the station's entrance hall through the ticket barrier and onto the platform. It was an incredible sight, 
with passengers wading through the water trying to reach their destination. It had now come to the point where I had to make a decision regarding my future career. An instructor's vacancy had arisen at the training school. Some of my fellow acting men had been there for longer than myself, but I was advised to apply. It was a big decision to make, and meant that if I was appointed, I couldn't go back driving trains at weekends. However, I was loving the job, so I applied. On the 18th of July 1989, I received a letter saying that my application had been successful and my transfer was arranged for the 7th of August. At the beginning of August, I had to sit in on a rules examination with Phil Eake, as it would now be necessary for me to conduct both rules and traction examinations for traction trainees and drivers. On Saturday the 5th of August, I was booked to move the contents of my locker from Woking to the OTC Southside, where I would take up residence as an E-grade traction instructor. My last day driving at Woking was on Sunday the 6th of August 1989, where I was booked 0600 as ordered. The following day, I took up my appointment as a full-time instructor at the OTC Southside and was booked to take a group of trainees out onto Class 455 driving instruction and then on Monday the 14th of August, I was booked to conduct my first traction exam. The two trainees that I was booked to examine were from Red Hill and Grove Park. Part B was a static exam and because the driver's main traction types were different, I elected to go to Victoria carriage sidings. Both drivers did well, recognising all equipment and were completely safe when it came to safety related 750 volt fuse changing procedures. The following day I met both trainees at Waterloo for their Part C exam, driving and travelled to Victoria so that they could work to Orpington and return using the EP and Westinghouse brake. They then required assessment on other types of EMU, 1963 stock and Class 455. This was conducted over the South Western Division. They were both pleased to find that they had both passed their final exams and were now qualified drivers, and I duly issued them both with EP keys. I couldn't help feeling the same elation that I felt when I was handed my EP key by Bob Phillips some 20 years previously. The following Sunday, I was booked to attend the OTC Southside to learn CSR, Cab Secure Radio, as this type of radio was now going to be fitted in cabs on all types of EMU on the Southern. Once a radio had been set up with the train's unique WTT working timetable number, the following communications could take place. Signalman can call and speak to driver, Driver can call and speak to signalman. Signalman and driver can exchange preset text messages. Signalman can send emergency stop messages to a particular train or all trains in an area. Driver can make an emergency call to signalman. Signalman can speak to passengers via the train's public address system. Signalman can connect driver to the railway telephone network. Signalman would be notified of a DSD driver's safety device alarm 30 seconds after the DSD is released by a driver on the train. Had CSR radio been fitted to all cabs the previous year, the Clapham disaster would most probably have been avoided. For the next month, I was either assisting courses on static days and driving instruction days, except for an exam on the 5th of September when I passed two drivers on rules, one from Slade Green Depot and one from Sellhurst. The following week I was given the day off with pay and in the evening collected my long service award for 28 years service. A Minox 35GT 35mm camera at the Woking Railways Staff Association Club. The week commencing the 18th of September I was booked road work and used routes Waterloo to Portsmouth Harbour and the 0933 Waterloo to Reading via Ascot. A good friend of mine was travelling on Concord on the Thursday and I'd noticed previously that its flight path flew straight over Reading Station on its way to New York at approximately 11am. When we reached Reading, we quickly changed ends, and I stood on the end of the platform waiting for the big moment, as I thought this would be a great opportunity to get a good photograph. I heard the plane, but couldn't see it, as unfortunately the wind at Heathrow had swung round and planes were taking off in a northerly direction. In April and May 1990, I was booked to go to Eastleigh Depot to conduct some special six rep courses with Fred Johnson. 
To begin with, 6 Rep Class 431 1903 had been specially commissioned and because there were two extra coaches added to the normal 4 Rep configuration and there were slight differences in the unit's faults and failures procedure, paddling up etc, it was deemed necessary that some of the Eastleigh and Bournemouth drivers would need further training. This was conducted over a number of weeks, including weekends, with half-day courses being delivered as morning and afternoon sessions. By Sunday the 13th of May, 82 drivers had received training, and the following day, train services were brought into operation utilising two six rep units, 1903 and 1905. Following three weekends of rep training, I also worked a further two Saturdays, these were to learn Class 319 units at Sellers with Brian Cook, which included a trip to Bedford in return. This was the first time I'd been under the wires, and after pressing the pan up button, which allowed the pantograph to connect to the 25 kV AC overhead current supply, I was astonished at the unit's acceleration. After continuing with the TM8 course, I took my trainees to Victoria carriage sidings for a 1957 static. During the instruction, it was necessary to open the master switch to perform control fault diagnosis, and although the parking brake was applied in the cab, some movement was felt at the rear of the train. A carriage cleaner came up and spoke to me and asked me if I'd moved the train, to which I replied that the rear of the train had moved, but this was caused by the train's couplings easing away as the brakes released on the train. I certainly didn't intentionally move the train, and apologised for any distress this may have caused him. He said that an apology wasn't good enough and that he was going to report the incident to his supervisor. I submitted the report and heard no more of the incident. On Monday the 30th of July 1990, it was decided that I would learn to instructor standards Class 73 electro-diesel locomotives with Brian Cook and we were taught schematics by Brian Hobby. This was a dream come true for me as they were my favourite locomotive and I've been driving them for the past 25 years. Brian and I went on a number of training trips as well as going down to Stewart's Lane to look round the locomotive in detail. On the 13th of September 1990, Brian Cook and I passed our Class 73 electro diesel schematic exams being examined by Cyril Sweet, Bernie Byrne and George Taylor. A couple of weeks before the exam, I remember taking the schematics with me on holiday to revise and sending a postcard to the training school saying that they made excellent beach mats. Whilst working the 1030 freight train with two Class 73s in multiple from Eastleigh to Three Bridges on the 16th of August 1990, a lineside fire at Barnum curtailed our training trip and we had to leave the two locomotives and train at Chichester Yard. Brian Cook, pictured here with Class 73 stroke 1 electro diesel number 73103, and I are detained at the end of Bosom platform whilst we wait for the signal. David Timothy and I were becoming great pals and were both interested in computers. The training school possessed a computer system but only had the simplest of word processors, Multimate, and graphic design packages. We both realised that if we didn't start getting to know how they worked, we'd be left behind in the IT, information technology world, and decided on buying one each. I didn't have a clue at that time what I needed, it was guided by him really. We travelled up to Tottenham Court Road, and I shelled out £1,200 for an Amstrad 1640 setup, plus a colour dot matrix printer. It sounded good at the time, and I thought it was the bee's knees then with a 40 megabyte hard drive and a five and a quarter inch floppy disk bay. I was completely hooked and my wife became a computer widow from then on. The following week I assisted on course TM18 and met two drivers at Waterloo for two days driving instruction. They were both Guildford drivers so I decided to take them to Portsmouth Harbour working a stopping service to give them plenty of practice on braking techniques. On the Wednesday I was taken off as I was needed for a class 73 static and met the trainees at Woking as there were several class 73 locomotives berthed there on Hurdles Road siding. On Monday the 22nd of October I was booked a class 73 training trip from Clapham to Weymouth and as the trip was cancelled the following day 
we had to change plans and perform a static day at Clapham instead. The training trip was reorganised on the Wednesday with the trip starting at Eastleigh and running to Wareham and return to Eastleigh, consisting of a Class 73 stroke 1 locomotive and two 4TC units. On the Thursday, we did actually reach Weymouth and on the Friday, we worked trips from Victoria to Gatwick and return, utilising the Gatwick Express stock. In X Works condition, just after being repainted into pool and livery to mark the 150th year of the London and Brighton line, Class 73 stroke 1, number 73101, Brighton Eve and Argus, passes Salfords at high speed with a Victoria to Brighton, Brighton Bell special, composed of Orient Express stock on the 21st of September 1991. The vintage VSOE coaches comprised Xena, Ioni, Ibis, Lucille, Vera, Phoenix, Audrey, Minerva and baggage car number 7. In this photograph we have class 73 stroke 1 number 73133 seen coupled to 4 SEP 1581 at Maidstone West. The loco had arrived about four hours late with the postal paper train from Victoria and had pushed 1581 from Strood to Maidstone West after it failed en route with the first train of the day. It returned minus vans to Strood. It's the only train of the day heading north from the county town. After it departed, the line closed for the rest of the day as most of the signalmen couldn't get to work on the branch. Class 73 stroke 0 number 73004, the Bluebell Railway, formerly JA type E6004, is shown here at Hastings. This locomotive was the first of its class to be named the Bluebell Railway, the name being transferred later to class 73 stroke 1 number 73133. Finally, 73 stroke 0 number 73002, formerly JA type E6002, at Tunbridge West Yard. The loco was delivered new to Stewart's Lane Depot on the 12th of March 1962 and remained there until withdrawal in May 1993.